Coach, would you like to begin with an opening statement? No, let's go to questions. All right, hot day. Let's go. Let's question. Anyone with questions for Coach Frost? Hands up. There's no way that we, here we go. Hey, Coach Frost, um, Tina Bovenzi with Spectrum News in Ohio. Um, looking at you guys' success or lack thereof over the past couple of years, you're not up to the standard where you'd want to be. I think you could, you'd say that yourself. Uh, how do you guys get back on track competitively and ultimately get to the Big Ten Championship? Yeah, competitively, I think, is, is the wrong way to put it. We were competitive uh, in every game last year. We had our chances to win. We've made a ton of progress as a program uh, from a talent perspective and a culture perspective. Uh, we haven't got it where we want it yet. Um, there's a little little piece we still got to put together to make sure we get over the hump, but we, we're excited to have another chance to do that. It's over here. Streaming XL Sports. Talk a little bit about taking the Big Ten to Ireland. And then, of course, the first question is going to be Casey Thompson. How's he coming along? And talk a little bit again, a, a segue into that, the competitiveness that Nebraska most likely will have this year in the West. Um, we're excited to go play in Ireland. There's some challenges that go along with that. Um, we've been planning for it for a long time. We're going to try to handle it as well as we can. Our, our players understand it. It's not a bull trip. We didn't earn it. We're going over there to play a football game, and that's got to be the focus. Um, Casey's one of many transfers we brought in. Uh, really excited about the talent we added to the football team. But talent doesn't win games. We've got to become a football team. And part of that's integrating the, the new players with the old and making sure we're one team uh, playing together. Um, excited for that first game. Uh, excited to compete in the Big Ten West. We were in every game last year with chances to win. Uh, looking forward to having a team that's hungry to make sure that, that we win some of those. Tino Bovenzi with Spectrum News One again. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Big Ten expansion, adding USC, UCLA in 2024, how that changes things uh, for Nebraska and, and your, your student athletes? Well, th there's a lot of changes right now, and we have to be light on our feet to make sure that we're trying to take advantage of every uh, change that happens and position ourselves in a good place. Uh, I just want to compliment the league and the leadership of the league. Um, I think everybody can see the landscape changing, and, and this move pretty much ensures that we're out in front of it and relevant in college football, no matter where it all ends up. Um, coached against those two teams before, I think they'll be great additions to the league, and um, looking forward to, to this year and beyond and, and uh, see where the whole thing lands when the dust settles. Right here. John Steppe, Cedar Rapids Gazette. How important has NIL been with what you've been able to do at Nebraska and the transfer portal? Yeah, I think it changes our model a little bit. Um, Nebraska is going to be one of the best places in the country for NIL. There's so much fan support. There's so much interest. There's so much passion around it. And a, a lot of uh, businesses and people in Nebraska have really given our, our current players a ton of opportunities already. Uh, I expect that to even grow as we go forward. And the attraction at NIL has certainly helped us uh, add some pieces to our team, and I think will going forward. Questions? Oh, we've got some in the back with TV here. Hi, Coach. Adam Kruger with CBS Omaha. Last year when you came here with Trev Alberts, it was kind of the getting to know you phase. How much has that relationship grown in the last year, and what stands out to you about Trev personality and how he goes about his business? Well, I think the great thing is we have two former Huskers um, and several more in the building that understand Nebraska and its uh, unique challenges and advantages. Um, we're both working as hard as we can to try to make Nebraska football and Nebraska athletics the best that we possibly can. Um, it's been a good collaboration, and uh, we're, we're both doing everything we can to position ourselves in, in the best place we can in this conference and beyond. I know I saw a hand up here somewhere. Right here again. Uh, 
Tino with Spectrum News One again. Uh, what are your thoughts on the college football playoff potential expansion? Um, are you in favor of that? You support it, or you think it should stay the same? Uh, you know, I've learned uh, from being a head coach that we can have our opinions and they don't really matter uh, unless you have need something to write about. Um, so I, I, I'm sure it'll land in a, in a good place when it's all done and when the people that make the decisions help help make it happen. Um, I would love to see it. Personally, would love to see it expand a little bit. Um, really, the biggest reason is it. You know, if if there's a team that might not be the highest ranked team in a conference championship and they win the conference championship, I th I think they probably earn a right to have a seat at the table. Um, and uh, having having more teams have an opportunity, I think, can only help the game. Uh, but they have to figure out a way to do it in a in a smart manner that um, doesn't get in the way of academics or anything else that college football is built on. Hi, Coach. Steve Hellwagon with 24-7 uh, Sports in Columbus. Uh, question I have, uh, three and nine is the record, but all nine of the losses by single digits. And you turn three of those, it's a, it's a bowl season. You turn six of those, you win the division. And you're right there in every game. Just what, and not to wallow in the losing or anything like that, but just what is it that can be done just to make that one more play, that one more thing that puts you guys over the top to start turning those close losses into, into wins. I mean, you're right there with Michigan. You're right there with Ohio State, both those games. Just what is it that's going to be that's, that's going to put it over the top? Yeah, we had a good enough team uh, last year to do better than we did. Um, you know, that, that falls on me. It falls on the whole coaching staff. It falls on the whole team. Um, compliment Ohio State. They, you know, they came into Lincoln with a really good football team, and, and we were right in the game, and we didn't win it. And that seemed to happen quite a bit. Uh, it'd be easy if it was one thing. It's a little harder because it was a little something different in every game. Um, and more than anything, uh, I think we just need to have a little more of a killer instinct uh, to finish games. And, and we get in those close games, uh, we need to finish them. Um, look forward to competing this year. I'm sure we'll be in some more. And we got to find a way to come out on top. Well, we've got one over here. And then we'll go in the back. John Steffi with the Cedar Rapids Gazette again. Special teams has obviously not been a strength for you the past few years. What's the key to turning that around? Yeah, it's been an emphasis for us, and we're looking forward to uh, working on that some more. The kids know how important it is. Um, our specialists, I think, are going to improve and do better this year, and I think we got more depth and athletic ability uh, to have guys that can cover. Um, the guys know how important it is, and we're looking forward to working. We'll go in the back over here. Coach Doug Duda, ESPN Tri-Cities. Can you continue to talk about stepping away from more of your offensive duties and turning that over to Coach Whipple and uh, how that allows you to do some other things here going into the fall? Yeah, stepping away is the wrong way to put it. I'm, I'm, I'm still going to have my hand in it. Um, it's going to be a fun collaboration with somebody else that knows a lot of football. Uh, when I'm not around the offense, uh, I'm going to be able to trust him to take care of it so I can do other things. And I, I'm looking forward to having a little more of that role, but still being involved a lot. Hi again, Coach. It's Kyle with Sports Report Media. Um, what have you learned about your team this summer that kind of stands out to you, one of those things that is going to make this team special this year? I think we got really good leadership, uh, kind of highlighted by the three kids that came to, to Indy with me, um, as good of leaders as we've had on the football team. I think there's a toughness about them that not our whole team, but maybe pieces of it lacked last year. And I, and I think uh, there's a chip on a lot of shoulders. It's an interesting uh, combination right now of guys that have been through some of the tough losses that we've been through and some newcomers, both on the staff and in the locker room, that haven't been through that. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is making sure we take the collection of guys and, and turn it into one team. All right, thank you. That will conclude our Q&A with Coach Frost. Coach, good thank luck you. in the coming year. Morning. Uh, excited to be back here in Indy. Um, looking forward to seeing all you guys throughout the day. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Warren uh, for his leadership. Uh, last year for us was a big step in the building process of the Maryland football family. We had a winning season, bowl victory, 
moved into a brand new facility, the Jones Hill House, and saw our team really come together up in New York. We have high expectations for ourselves this year. You know, when you have the type of year we had last year, the natural reaction is to say, let's build upon it. Um, we don't see ourselves building on it because last year, last year's version of Maryland football is no longer here. And I hope what we can take from last season is the work that we put in, the necessary uh, process that we put in place for us to have that type of year. And so we're looking forward to this year's version of the Maryland football family doing the necessary things, playing with the type of discipline, the type of toughness, the type of effort, as well as being committed and connected to take the next step that we need to take as a program. We have high expectations for ourselves heading into the 22 season. It's probably the deepest football program or football team that we've had since I've been back here at Maryland. On offense, we have over 163 starts, uh, 15 different guys that have started a game. On the defensive side of the ball, we have over 113 starts with 16 different guys having started a game. I'm a strong believer in continuity and leading to success. And for the first time, uh, we have a, a coaching staff, whether it's the offensive coordinator, Dan Enos, coming back, along with Bryant Williams, our defensive coordinator, who took over the last couple of games of last season. And both those guys have done a tremendous job on those two phases. And I expect us to continue to take that next step. Uh, Talia Tungavailoa returns uh, for a third season after breaking numerous Maryland football records. I don't think there's a more underrated player in the country than Talia Tungavailoa, and I'll continue to say it, as he's a guy that has really been the catalyst to making us go on offense. Uh, all five of our starting offense alignment are back, and to me, that is the most improved unit on our team, and I'm looking forward to seeing us take that next step. Consistency in the coordinator room, as I talked about earlier, uh, Dan Enos has been uh, a, a, a godsend for me. Uh, being an offensive guy, he's one of those guys that has come in and uh, co called plays with his personality and really did a good job leading the offense last season. I, and I expect us to continue to, to play really well and be explosive on the offensive side of the football. Uh, Brian Williams was elevated to the defensive coordinator position uh, right before the Rutgers game, and I thought he did a tremendous job leading the defense from the front of the room. Uh, he's been with me since I hired, since I got hired in 2019. We brought in some new coaches on, in, on both sides of the ball that I think have continued to bring and add to what we do. I want to give a lot of credit to our players. Uh, these guys have really put the work in. Like all programs, they've really done a great job of buying into all of the things that we've asked them to do, as well as our strength and conditioning staff headed up by Ryan Davis, who continues to be uh, the glue for our program. We report to training camp in exactly one week, and I'm really excited about seeing what the version of this version of the Maryland football family looks like. And I am really, truly appreciate all that you guys do in terms of covering college football and really looking forward to this season. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Down in front here. Hey, Coach. Ryan McFadden from the Baltimore Sun. How's it going? What's up, Ryan? <laughs> uh, I want to ask you uh, about Dante Dimas. Uh, just what can you share, of, share with us with, about his recovery process? And is he someone you expect to be ready for week one? Yeah, Dante is ahead of schedule. Um, actually, really, really been impressed with the way he's uh, returned. Uh, our training staff, led by Brian Somerville, has done a tremendous job getting Dante back. I think, you know, last week he broke 21 or 22 on the catapult, which means he's got that explosiveness back. We do expect him, uh, barring any setbacks during training camp, which we'll do a good job of trying to protect them and, and get them to that opening game. But there is the expectation that we'll see Dante Demas playing in the first game. We'll go over here to my right again. Jay Stevens, Locked On Podcast Network. In what areas have you seen growth from Talia in this offseason? You know, the biggest thing for me with Talia is to uh, as we talk about in our program, you know, every play has a shelf life, meaning when the play is over, it dies. And for Talia, he's one of those guys that puts a lot of pressure on himself. Uh, there's nobody that uh, 
has more expectations than he does. And what we've got, what we've seen him do here from, I say, mid midpoint of last season on, is I've seen a maturity in how he manages himself, whether it's a good play, not letting that good play get him too high, or if it's a bad play, letting it kind of get him too low. And we like to keep him at that neutral position. Uh, I've seen that growth out of him. I see a comfort level in our system. And to me, that's probably if there was a, one area we wanted to see him improve in is just the emotional maturity, and we've seen that out of Talia. Did we have a question over on this side? I thought I saw somebody with their hand up. Oh, over here. Oh, okay, we've got, we've got two here. And I'll go here and here and then here. Hi, Coach. Tino Bovenzi with Spectrum News One. Uh, being on the East Coast, how do you, uh, you know, what's your reaction to this Big Ten expansion at in USC, U UCLA, uh, that flight that you guys will have to take uh, every now and again? How that changes things for student athletes and, and the future overall? You know, I think it's a win for for the conference, and obviously, you know, the, the commissioner and the powers that be felt that they are a fit for the Big Ten. Uh, very like-minded to universities are very like-minded to the to what the Big Ten's all about great academics and great great athletics and so uh, to add those two type of teams that have storied history uh, is a win for the Big Ten as far as the flight you know what it's it is what it is and, and and you know for us you know we'll play the games that end up on our schedule we'll manage it and come up with a way to hopefully allow us to get out there and play our best but uh, great to have those two storied programs uh, come to the Big Ten. Michael over here, XL Sports. A lot of talk, of course, of Maryland is the offense. And first off, congratulations on the winning season since 2014. The, the question I have is your front seven on the defense. Where do you see some improvement at? Because your back end looks pretty good. Talk a little bit about the front seven, if you can, for a couple of minutes. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing I'll say about the front seven, first of all, we've got a lot of experienced guys with Mo Kite uh, coming back for a, a second, se a third season, uh, Ami Finau. Uh, we've had a lot of injuries. That's kind of been our Achilles heel on the defensive side of the ball. We've had a lot of injuries. You know, Darrell Chami is healthy, one of the best pass rushers in our program. And like you talked about, having uh, our secondary back, a guy like Deontay Banks, Jacorian Bennett, Tarheeb Steele, all three of those guys lost games last year due to injury and having those guys healthy and as, as well as uh, you know that second level of our defense last year we lost Fanage Gote in our opener uh, a veteran player that uh, has played a lot of football and then there's been the addition of some really talented players uh, we brought two freshmen in mid-year Caleb Wheatland and, and Jay Sean Barham who we think will add tremendous depth uh, but I think the biggest thing with our front seven on the defensive side of the ball is that we have experience and, and we're healthy and it's you know we need to keep those guys healthy and we'll go with the last question here uh, coach I just want to get your view on the current state of NIL and and what are some improvements you personally think that should happen you know, NIL is one of those things that, as we've all said, um, I, it's good for it's good for the student athlete. Um, they deserve it. Um, as you continue and as we continue to kind of figure it out as coaches, there are some guardrails that that we need to put in place. Uh, you know, obviously, once they're in your program, for them to to take advantage of their name, image, and likeness, and for a place like Maryland, being located uh, in between two major metropolitan areas, you've got over 10 Fortune 500 companies in that area. I think it would be very beneficial for kids in our program. But what we've got to do is control it and how it's being used in the recruitment of players. And to me, uh, that's where I think we we've got to continue to try to find a a sweet spot with uh, how it's managed and how it's used. But uh, I'm all for it. I've been on the record for, for being all for NIL. And uh, we'll continue to navigate it as we learn it. OK, that will conclude our Q&A here with Coach Loxley. Coach, we wish you and your team health and success this year. Thank you very and much. It's great to see everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to be back for year six at the University of Minnesota and actually uh, 10 years being a head football coach. And I promise you this, I haven't taken one day for granted being a head football coach, especially in this league. Um, 
I want to thank our President Joan Gable, our Athletic Director Mark Coyle for their leadership. I want to thank Commissioner Warren uh, for his leadership. Uh, to say that that leadership's been easy over the last few years uh, would be an understatement and uh, not true. So he's really, uh, really led us through some really tough times. Um, I want to say hi to my wife, Heather. She's watching on TV with my kids, Gavin, Carter, Paisley, and Harper. It's always good to say hi to them as they watch um, me on TV, I'm sure. So um, excited for year six. I'm really, really excited about our players. I want to thank our players for all the work they've done in the offseason. I want to thank our strength staff, Dan Nickel, who I think is one of the best in the country. Uh, they've been working incredibly hard as well. And we're going to continue to, uh, to strive to be the best we can be uh, at creating uh, one of the most exciting developmental and educational life programs in the country. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, brought four amazing young men with us. Uh, Tanner Morgan, uh, John Michael Schmitz, Mariano Sori Marin, and Tyler Newbin. Uh, Tanner Morgan has been around the league, it seems like, forever. Right? He's entering year six. Uh, he's got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and... And now he's kind of a non-major student uh, at the University of Minnesota, just uh, taking classes and, and going to be, uh, you know, going to lead our football team. Got married here a, a few weeks ago, which I'm sure you all know, to his wife, Sarah. It must be contagious on our team because John Michael Schmitz, who's, uh, you know, a preseason All-American, uh, you look at top of the Remington list, his name's right up there, uh, is also engaged to be married here coming up. These six-year guys, and they, they call themselves the Encore Four. So it's going to be interesting to see um, those guys, and it's been really fun to watch their lives develop on and off the field. Uh, got guys getting married already. Uh, he's a phenomenal football player, incredible person. Mariano Sori Marin I'm from Providence Catholic in Illinois, one of our middle linebackers, uh, the ultimate connector on our defense. Uh, you talk about a guy who'd be a phenomenal coach one day, he'll do that. He's also an incredible foodie. I'm sure you guys are going to get a chance to be around him. Uh, he's got a list of 105 restaurants that he's visited that I'm sure that he'll probably talk to you about those and has ranked all of them. you got a certain type of food you like, he'll definitely give you where you should go and give you a ranking on that. And then Tyler Newbin, uh, one of our safeties, uh, has been an instrumental part in what we've done. We did a, a tape the other day for our team and showed them the, the, the big plays from last year, and Tyler Newbin was around all of those. And uh, his dad, Rodney, and, and mom, Sharice, who were both athletes at Eastern Michigan University, are, are very involved in our program, and it's great to have Tyler here. Uh, when your best players are your hardest workers, uh, I think you have something really special. And we're talking about year six. We have a lot of guys who chose to come back uh, for that six year, and a lot of newcomers that will be on our football team that will be helping us for the first time. When we're talking about a life program, we talk about academics, athletics, social, spiritual, uh, becoming elite in every single area of your life. Uh, our, our team cumulative GPA is at a 3-3 right now. Uh, we have 11 straight semesters at a 3-0, which we're really excited about, or higher. We have eight academic All-Americans in the last five years. And uh, to give you a little bit of that, that we look back in, in, in the 20 years prior to us being there, we had eight total. And in the last year, uh, five years, we've had eight. Uh, you look at our NFL draft picks. We had four NFL draft picks this year with Boye Mafe going in the second round, Daniel Falele going in the fourth round, um, Sezi Otomewo going in the fifth round, and then Co Keefe going to the sixth round of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We also have four others on NFL teams as well. And if you look at the last two full seasons of nine plus wins that we've had, uh, that's the first time we've basically had back-to-back -back full season, nine-win season since 1900 through 1905. So there's a lot of positive things in our program. I'm really proud of our players. Can't wait to see what happens this season. It's a fun team. It's a committed team, uh, probably more than I've ever had in the six years being at the University of Minnesota. It's probably the most committed team, and I look forward to what they have. So with that, we'll open up for questions. In the back over here. That's it, you got him. Hi, PJ. Scott Docterman with The Athletic. I wanted to ask you about the return of Mo Ibrahim and what does he mean for your team on the field and the way he competes, but then also uh, what kind of leadership and other kinds of uh, qualities he brings to your team as well. Yeah, Mohammed's part of that encore four that they're kind of calling themselves. And with, I'm not sure if that's NIL or not or some copyright infringement that I just threw out there for him. But you got Mo, you got Tanner, uh, you got John Michael Schmitz, and you got Crab. 
Uh, and you talk about Mohamed Ibrahim. I mean, he, here's a guy who could have went to the National Football League after tearing his Achilles. I think we all saw it. I mean, he had close to 170 yards in the first half uh, against Ohio State. Uh, and he was primed for a huge season. Uh, decided to come back not only for himself, but for his teammates. And I think that kind of spread throughout our entire team. John Michael Schmitz coming back, Tanner Morgan coming back, Crab coming back, Chris Hoffman Bell. Uh, they made choices based on really what Mo was going to do. Uh, Mo could have went to the National Football League because, as he would say, 5'8 five is 5'8. Five I mean, he's not going to get any taller. Uh, but he did it for the team. And he did it to kind of put a different ending to what happened. Uh, I think he's one of the best backs in the country. But more importantly, he's one of the best people you will ever meet in your entire life. And his leadership has become really infectious based on real-world experiences. Here's a guy who had a lot of NIL, right? And you run for 170 yards in the first half. You got all this stuff, and then boom, it all ends. And he can share a lot of those experiences uh, with our team and those life experiences. So it means the world to us that he's coming back. He's at full strength. Uh, he's ready to roll. Uh, and we're excited about having him uh, have a really, really uh, positive 2022. Over here. Uh, Randy Johnson, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Hi, Randy. Uh, IPJ, uh, what are your thoughts on USC and UCLA joining the Big Ten? What challenges and opportunities that would present for Minnesota? I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was LA. Are you kidding me? That's perfect. I mean, the Big Ten now is represented from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, and you look at the major media markets now, I mean, that's incredibly positive. I look at it, everything through the lenses of the University of Minnesota. We have a ton of living alumni out on the West Coast. And now that Big Ten footprint is really stationed there for all of our alumni. Um, I think when you kind of look at does playing out there help recruiting, uh, yes and no. I think it's very different than it used to be 10 years ago where kids can live stream games. They can watch any game they want. They have all the types of resources in their phones. Uh, but I do think it's really positive for the conference and the league. Uh, we're excited about it. It's coast to coast. Uh, I think people asked me a question back there about travel. Uh, I think maybe other sports could be affected. But, again, I, I look through it from the football eyes, and I, I was part of Maction. <laughs> You know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights on nine-hour bus rides. And I'm not sure how many people ask me that question. Um, so I think there's people way smarter than me that will figure all that out in terms of how we're going to make that all work. Uh, but, again, it's, it's a really it, it's a positive blueprint uh, for the Big Ten. And uh, change is uh, really healthy. And it's a big change. And we're excited about having the L.A. market uh, into the Big Ten. Ryan Burns, 24-7 Sports. Hey, Ryan. PJ, I'm curious how you would define balance for your offense this fall. Yeah, doing what it takes to win football games. I think that's how we define balance. I think the easy thing is to say, okay, run for 200, pass for 200. But I think what Kirk Scirocco would tell you, and you know, we talked about this a long time ago, if we have to throw for 350, we need to be able to throw for 350. If we have to run for 350 to win, then we have to find a way to run for 350. And I think what you saw last year was, think back in 2019, we had two first-team All-Big Ten wide receivers for the first time in the history of the league, and then also had a 1,000-yard rusher, had one of the best offenses in the country. And then last year, we lose five tailbacks, four of our receivers missed three to four-plus games, and everybody says, what happened? And we still won nine games. And that's a, that's a testament to finding a way on the, in the system to – do what the strength of your football team is. And we still had one of the best offensive lines in the country. So we had to make the game shorter. We had to run the ball a little bit more. We had to do what we had to do to find ways to win games. Um, but now when you look at the balance, when we're at our best, we are balanced. I think any team would be able to want that in a perfect world. But balance to me means you do exactly what you have to do to win that game and have the ability to do that on a weekly basis. Did we have a question over here? Yep. Good morning, Coach. Todd morning. Sadowski with Fox 43 hey, Sports. I want to continue the Sharaka theme, and uh, we just want to ask you, were you surprised that it went so quickly at Penn State it didn't work out for Coach Sharaka? How quickly did you have a conversation with him about returning to Minnesota? And maybe Tanner's reaction as a six-year guy, because he's worked with Kirk in the past to run the offense with him. Yeah, I think we're all talking you know, at the, at the media days about change. Change is really hard. It's really hard to do. It's hard to accept. It's hard to move on from that. Uh, and a lot of people ask me, you know, were, were you hurt when Kirk left? I said, no. 
uh, besides letting me know on Christmas morning, I said there really wasn't anything that I was mad about. Um, but I said that that's not what loyalty is about, staying with somebody forever. Loyalty is giving 100% committed job effort at that particular time while you work for that person and while you work for that environment. Um, but I'm not sure I wouldn't have done the same thing Kurt did uh, and taken opportunities from Pennsylvania. His family, uh, he had some family things going on, especially with his dad back home. Uh, it was a great opportunity for him, especially financially, and uh, supported him 100%. We've had a great friendship that goes beyond football. But when the opportunity came back to hire him, him and I, it was easy. It was like, yes. What I respect about Kirk was Kirk wanted to know how that would affect the kids. And I wanted to know how that would affect the kids. So you start asking people a little bit about how would you feel if somebody, you know, came back. And, you know, guys got really excited about that. And, of course, I said you might have to answer some questions in your first team meeting. But that'll be easy after five minutes and we're good. And he did. And he addressed it head on. Talked about why he left. Talked about why he's back. Uh, we're excited to have him. Uh, I know Tanner's really excited to have him. And, um, you know, he makes me a better head football coach. And when – one thing I can do really well is hire people that are way smarter than me. Uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's out there about my 18 ACT score three times. I mean, you hire people that are way smarter than you, and you can find a way to move up pretty quick. And that's what um, I found a way to do. And he does that. He's really smart, really intelligent, makes me a better hit football coach. I, I hope we make him a better coordinator. And, um, you know, we're really excited to have him. Okay, we're going to go in the back and the right over here. PJ, uh, Andy Greeter, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Hi, Andy. Uh, PJ, you talked a few times about being the most committed team that you've had. Uh, what does that mean exactly, and what examples do you have that, that make you say that? Yeah, the committed part always has to do with, like, have to versus want to, right? There's, a, there's this decision to be made. Okay, here's what I have to do. Here's on the schedule. And then do I really want to do that have to part? And then after that, what is the unrequired work that I'm going to do on my own that's going to make me a better football team and make me a better football player? And our leadership on this football team is fully committed to all of it. They want to do the have-to stuff. They can't wait to do it. They're off the field on their own doing unrequired work. They're doing unrequired things together, right? Um, they're doing, you know, they, they've, our HERE initiative back home, our Gopher for Life programs with the attendance that they have, the non-football stuff. This team is fully committed to each other. It's been fun to watch. And you get that vibe when you go down and watch them work. Um, you can You can – kind of weed through all the other things that don't matter and get right to the right to the heart of what matters with this football team. Um, and that's what I appreciate about them. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have any time for silliness. They go right in, get their work done, and, um, and get better. All right. Thank you, Coach. That will conclude uh, Coach Fleck's Q&A uh, session. Coach, good luck to you and your team, and uh, good health coming forward in the 2022 season. I appreciate that. Roll the boats, Guy Imago, Gophers. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, or good morning, I should say. Appreciate uh, everybody's interest in our program, certainly the Big Ten and, and college football overall. Uh, I feel really fortunate and thankful to be starting my 33rd year at Iowa. Uh, I was a nine-year assistant back in the 80s and then starting uh, you know, my 24th year as a head coach now. So you know, I've long considered Iowa one of the best places to coach, and really it's uh, pretty much uh, the majority of what I know during my time in coaching. Uh, and I think the one commonality, whether it's the 80s or certainly the last 20 plus years, it's just the quality of the people. Uh, and that's coaches that I've worked with, also the players, most importantly the players, uh, just outstanding people and outstanding leaders. So I feel very, very fortunate about that. And I think probably like most everybody that stood up here uh, thus far and will continue to come up here, uh, you know, there's a real love of the game that uh, I think all of us possess and certainly a uh, uh, love of coaching. So. You know, that being said, I think probably uh, I would not be uh, the only person to say really concerned about the path that college football is on right now and eager, eager to see where it, uh, where it heads and, you know, how we, uh, what direction we end up taking. But it's a great game. Uh, it was a big game, big thing in 1980 when I went to the University of Pittsburgh as a grad assistant. Uh, it was big when I went to Iowa in 81. And uh, if anything, it's just grown bigger, certainly. That's, uh, you know, it's always been big and it's bigger now. But with that, I think, you know, you just uh, have to think about our players. You think about the voices that they hear, 
the things that they have to deal with, the hands that are on them, uh, the noise that they're listening to, and most of all, I think the pressure, and that's certainly a concern I have as I uh, think about our football team and uh, long have felt that way. I think sometimes we lose sight about uh, you know, just how, how young our players are and just how recently they were uh, maybe in the backyard catching a pass or out playing in the street, playing touch football. So, uh, you know, it goes quickly for those guys. Everybody that plays in the Big Ten typically is probably the best uh, player on their high school team or certainly, certainly one of their best. But all that being said, it's still a big jump when you go to college football just like it is if they play beyond. And at the, all that being said, I think, you know, our focus at Iowa, at least during my 33 uh, years has been on development of our players and trying to uh, help them grow and you know prepare for their lives after after their college experience. Uh, you know, a small percentage will get an opportunity to play in the NFL. A much smaller percentage will have a career in the NFL. But for the most part, uh, the reality is most players uh, their careers end when their eligibility expires. So that that's really kind of the reality of what we do, and I think that's why it's so important. When they're in college, they're doing more than just learning their plays or you know developing their skill set. Uh, and to me, the best part about football and college football is just learning to be part of a team and uh, what that really means and just you know having respect for other people and uh, realizing there's a lot of other things uh, that are bigger than you. And to me, that carries, uh, carries our players well as they move into their adult lives. Uh, our message this year for our team in 2022 is the same it's ever been. You know, just uh, want our guys to focus on the love of the game, love of the work that's involved, which is significant, and most importantly, uh, the love of the people you're with. And, um, you know, to me, that's the best part about sports and certainly the best part about football. And if you do that, uh, my experience is, you know, the player ends up being a better player, but more importantly, a better person and is better prepared to move on into adult life. And that's, that's the ultimate re reality for most of our players. Uh, a couple words about our team. You know, it's like pretty much like every year we have a really good group of veteran players back. Uh, we had a good football team, as Commissioner Warren cited last year. So we've lost some good players too and have voids to uh, fill. We've had a chance as coaches to watch the guys who we anticipate to move into those positions, working behind the scenes, if you will, or, uh, you know, on the practice field an awful lot. And, you know, just excited to see where they all go, uh, how they grow, how they develop, how they meet the challenges. Certainly a lot of excitement for everybody this time of year, fans and uh, coaches as well, but also some anxiety in that you're never quite sure how a player is going to react when they, they come out of the tunnel in the swarm, 70,000 people uh, there to cheer them on. Just never quite sure how they're going to go. But, you know, we've seen growth and uh, just excited to see what it looks like here as it unfolds starting next week. Uh, defensively, real, real quick, we lost uh, three really quality players in the back end, Matt Hankins, uh, Jack Kerner, and uh, um, Dane Belton. Three outstanding players up front, Zach Van Valkenburg. So, you know, we've got some some uh, work to do in the back end, certainly. And then up front, I think collectively, we've got a good group of guys uh, that really grew last year and, and hopefully they'll continue to grow and fill in those voids. Um, you know, we've got some veteran players, certainly, uh, coming back at the linebacker position. Jack Campbell's here, Kayvon Merriweather in the back end, Riley Moss is one of our better players. So, you know, those are some of the guys that we'll be leaning on to uh, help the younger guys move forward. And then offensively, um, unlike the defense, or not unlike the defensive line, we were young last year. Uh, we had one of the best players in college football, entire Linderbaum, but overall we were a pretty young group. So we lose Tyler, but I think collectively we, we feel good about uh, the group and anxious to see how they develop. Uh, we've got two quarterbacks that have won games for us and, you know, played well on the field, and we expect both of them anticipate they're both going to be really better this year in uh, Spencer Petrus and uh, Alex Padilla. And then the running back receiver room, uh, both uh, those groups are young. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of young players in both of those uh, outside of Nico Regani, who's a veteran receiver, but the rest of the guys are really young uh, in both positions. Uh, the Williams is at the running back position, and then um, Arlen Bruce, Keegan Johnson, just to name a couple receivers. So it'd be uh, interesting to see how they develop here in year two for those guys. And grow and then the tight end position we feel good about with uh, uh, Sam Laporte is here with the group and uh, Luke Lachey is a really I think a really good football player as well so um, you know certainly uh, we've got some work to do there and some growing to make and uh, improvement to make but we'll see how that goes out special teams kind of the tail two cities we've got uh, Tory Taylor back as our punter uh, for his third season really uh, unique young person a really good football player but we lost Caleb Shudak, an outstanding place kicker. So uh, that competition's open right now. And I can say the same thing about the return game. Uh, you know, we've got guys auditioning for that. So, 
you know, we're excited to start. We're excited to get uh, back on the field with our players and see what, what August brings. And uh, we'll know a little bit more about our team, certainly, at the end of the month. So that being said, I'll throw it out for questions. Over here. John Steppe, Cedar Rapids Gazette. It's been about five months since you had Brian move over to coaching quarterbacks. What have your, been your impressions so far of how that's gone? I think he's done a great job. Uh, really, I think we have an outstanding staff right now. And uh, uh, a special, selfishly, one of the nice things, we have five uh, former players, which means I'm getting old, I guess. But we have five former players on our staff. Uh, I think he's made the transition well. He's worked hard and uh, worked hard at it. John Budmeyer joined our staff as an analyst. Uh, so he's been a great resource as well, as have uh, some other people. And uh, I think the key component there, from my vantage point, was to have our play caller and uh, be coaching the quarterbacks. I think just trying to uh, minimize some you know, opportunities for confusion or that type of thing and try to get a little more clarity in what we're doing. So, so far, so good. More questions, please. All right, we'll go here, and then we'll go here. Coach Lane Harrington, Stay Alive Power 5, how are you? Good, how about you? I'm all right. So last week it was reported that your assistant coaches received like a 31% bump in salary. However, your son, office coordinator Brian Ferentz, received the smallest increase. Was there a reason that Iowa's struggles on offense have anything to do with that? No, not necessarily. I think, you know, he's been compensated pretty well, and uh, you know, the bottom line is I feel two things. I feel uh, like our staff, um, the numbers, you know, there's reasons for everything we do. And uh, we have private conversations regarding that. But I feel like uh, the staff salaries reflect levels of experience, uh, you know, contributions to the program. And uh, the other, other part about it, and that was important, as you probably know, uh, I signed a contract uh, back at the new year. Yeah, and there were two things uh, that were important to me. Most important was just make sure our staff was well compensated. I just got done saying I really feel good about our entire staff. And if we end up losing a coach, I want it to be for, you know, really good reasons, not because, you know, we're not able to pay them enough. So, uh, you know, as a, as a head coach, it's important to me that we're able to keep, keep guys, retain guys, and uh, hopefully it's an attractive place for them to work. As I said in my earlier comments, it's been, to me, it's been one of the greatest places ever. Uh, to work, and I hope our staff feels the same way. But I, I think we're in a good place with everybody on the staff. We'll go in the back over here. Hi, Kirk. Scott Docterman with Thanks, The Scott. Athletic. Uh, Jack Campbell seems to be on a similar trajectory as some of your better linebackers you've had in your tenure. In what ways is he similar to some of the better ones that came through? And then are there any physical or other traits that, that make him special or unique? Yeah. Uh, He's got a skill set that's unusual, uh, just his height and range. That's it's a little bit unusual for us, at least uh, historically. Uh, I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'd say he's probably our tallest linebacker, probably in 23 years, I'm guessing. Uh, but beyond that, you know, uh, he just plays smart and plays with unbelievable desire. And I think the first thing I, I would uh, cite with Jack, and that's probably true of a lot of really good players I've been around, pro college or high school, were good coaches I've been around. He's extremely humble. Uh, you know, he's not not about taking credit for anything. He deserves a lot. He is a leader in his way. Uh, but he's authentic. He's humble and uh, really driven to, you know, to do his best. And, and he's doing it for all the right reasons. He's got great pride in what he does, but he also has, uh, feels a responsibility to really be at his best for our team. And I, as a coach, you, you just value that so much and appreciate it. Okay, we do have a final question right over here. Hey, Kirk, Andy Wittry with On3. I saw that you were on hand at the Swarm Collective's press conference. How did that relationship come about, and what is that conversation like ongoing? Well, uh, the relationship with Brad, is that what you're referring to? Brad yeah, I just, uh, just had the good fortune of meeting Brad here in the last two months. Um, you know, uh, I'll share this, and I say this often. One of my biggest fears about coming back to college football 23-plus years ago was donors, and it's been one of the most uh, – greatest fortunes of my life, uh, the donors I've got to meet and uh, get involved with. And I say donors, I'm talking about people that just support, really support our program. And uh, Brad has just done an unbelievable job. He's, I can't imagine how much time and energy he's put into this. Uh, as I mentioned, I just mentioned him it's inside a window of two months. Just an extremely impressive person. Uh, I never knew what an actuary does, nor did I really understand how you become an actuary. And 
everybody I knew in college it was going to become an accountant. They wanted to jump out of windows all the time, and actuary is probably about ten times harder. So he's a, he's a pretty smart guy. I think it's fair to say that. He's got a great personality, great resilience. He was an athlete, and just uh, I'm so appreciative. I think I, I don't want to speak for other people. I think I speak for everybody on our campus's behalf. Just appreciative of his interest uh, and his willingness to, to help. And I think we're doing it in a way that fits fits our program, the values, and uh, the way we see the world. So I'm extremely appreciative to uh, Brad's willingness to get involved in his contributions already. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Coach, good luck this year and stay healthy. Uh, we are going to take a quick break here. and. Uh, we thank you, Commissioner Warren. I appreciate it. Tell you what, what a beautiful place to have this Every year needs to be this every uh, time we come. I hope it stays this way. Uh, love being here. Love being back. Uh, blessed to be the head coach of the United Hoosiers and just uh, excited for the 2022 season. Um, our team's been working hard since January. Uh, the bottom line is, is uh, things didn't go the way we wanted them to go in 2021. And when that's the case, you do one of two things. Uh, you either feel sorry for yourself or you sit there and do a thorough evaluation of everything that you do which is what we began in January and uh, had a chance to, to go through that process, uh, make changes, uh, add some uh, new players to our team, add some new staff to our, to our program, and then allow us to get back to work. And that's what we've done. We're very blessed to be able to open our season for the fourth time since I've been at Indiana uh, with the Big Ten opponent. So September 2nd, we'll be hosting Illinois in Memorial Stadium on a Friday night. And uh, just excited to be able to welcome Coach Bielema and uh, appreciate and respect him and the job he's doing there and his program. And, and uh, just uh, really feel like that it's become a new tradition for us to be able to start uh, the season with a Big Ten opponent. And uh, I think it's become a great, great thing for, for the Indiana Hoosiers. And when I think about uh, the evaluation process that we went through as a program, and, and, I, and I think about the standard that we set in 2019 by breaking through, and I think about the historic season we had in, in 2020. Uh, but I also understand that, that sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go. And, and when you experience that, I think you get a chance to find out who you are and what foundation that you have. And so I really uh, respect the young men that we brought with us today uh, that have been a part of this team. We're with us in 2019. We're with us in 2020. Uh, we're with us in 2021. Guy like Cam Jones, all Big Ten linebacker, that's going to be voted as a three-time captain this fall. That's really special. Doesn't happen very often. And he's a young man that brings a lot of great qualities to our team and allows us to be able to to be the kind of program I want us to be on the field and off the field, in the classroom. And I think about Taiwan Mullen, first-team All-American, first-team All-Conference uh, cornerback uh, that came to Indiana with a vision and a mission to help us change our football program. And he joins us here today. And then also A.J. Barner, tied in, that's been in the, the shadows of Peyton Hendershot, all Big Ten tied in the last couple of years. And now this is his opportunity to, to be able to show who he is uh, on the football field. Love his leadership. That's a big reason why he's here today. And all three of those young men are all Big Ten academically in the classroom. Uh, they're excellent human beings off the field, involved in community service and, and uh, doing all that they can do to help make our program very, very special. So really, really honored to have those three guys here today. And I'm looking forward to you having the chance to, to get to talk to them, meet them, and also see how special they truly are. Also want to honor a special person as part of our university and Don Fisher as he's being recognized and is being announced today as the 2022 National Football Foundation Chris Schenkel Award winner for being basically for 50 years. I mean, think about that for 50 years being the iconic voice of the Indiana Hoosiers and just respect him so much and the well-deserved honor that he has uh, in a long list of honors that he's received over the years. And I just also want to just close by saying, uh, before I take some questions here, that uh, the opportunity to be able to impact, as, as even Coach or Commissioner Warren alluded to earlier, and the lives of the individuals in our community and, and our players is what draws me to do what I do. 
and I love this team. We've got a great opportunity to be able to, to, to build uh, upon the traditions we have in our program and to be able to have a, a chance to take the field in 2022 after a, a tough 2021 and be able to have a group of young men come together and do something special. So can't wait to get started. Fall camp will begin a week from today. We report on Sunday, media day on Monday, first practice on Tuesday, August 2nd. So at this time, we're ready for any questions. We'll start down over here to our right, our left coach. Hey, good morning, coach. Jeff Rabjohnspeaks.com. With the quarterback situation, do you anticipate one person clearly winning it in camp and just being the guy all the way? Are there options for multiple guys? And with Donovan, is he going to be 100% receiver, or is there a possibility he could be a little bit of both this year? You know, I would say that uh, we will go through this process of evaluating our guys. And I, and I will say, you know, by design, and we came out of spring football and felt like there wasn't a clear uh, guy to name, and so uh, did not do that. And, uh, but I love the competition piece uh, to the process and to be able to have to prove it every single day all summer long, now into fall camp. Uh, obviously, we will have a, a starter uh, named uh, before the opener. Uh, but uh, um, bottom line is, is that... Um, once that person is named, he'll be the starter, uh, not expecting a dual situation. Uh, but at the same time, as we saw last year, and we learned up close and personal that, uh, you know, things happen and injuries happen. And you better have more than one guy that's going to be able to be your starting quarterback, you know, in your program. So I feel like we have that uh, with uh, several different individuals. Donovan's and the other young man has played for us at uh, quarterback position, have moved into receiver. But, yes, we'll still be able to have, you know, packages for him in that, in that opportunity because of his skill set that he brings to our football team. And it's all about getting your best players on the field. We'll go down over here. Hey, Coach. Uh, Jack Ankeny, Sports Illustrated, Indiana. Um, Micah McFadden's been kind of the heart and soul of your defense the last three years. Obviously, you lose him and return Cam Jones. Could you talk about those three uh, transfer linebackers that you've brought in and how they've worked to kind of replace a player of Mad uh, McFadden's caliber? Yeah, Micah was special. You know, uh, just pretty obvious on the field. A tremendous young man off the field. Uh, love him and his family. Excited for his a new opportunity here with the Giants. He's just beginning here in their in their training camp, and so that is a void that uh, that Cam Jones has really responded to in a huge way and the leadership piece as well in that linebacker room because I'm a, I'm a former linebacker myself and and coach the position played the position and and uh, you're only as good as your linebackers in your defense and so you mentioned the guys that we brought in I think Cam's gonna be a big part of it I think uh, Aaron Casey another young man that's gonna step up and do great things for us this season because of his work ethic and his passion for our program and for himself to be able to be his very very best and and uh, you know Bradley Jennings coming to us from Miami and uh, and Jared Casey coming to us from Kentucky, two transfers that I feel like that uh, give us, uh, you know, Big Ten type caliber players that have already played the position at other schools. And so to me, that excites me, you know, because that position is big for us. You know, Desan McCall is another one that's, that's coming in as a freshman that we expect to be able to have opportunity to help us and, and uh, see his development and, and see how he responds to playing, you know, Big Ten football. And so that's a, that's a room to me that's critical for our team to be able to uh, uh, play at a high level defensively. And I always evaluate our linebackers by two key things. You got to be a leader and you got to produce. It's about leadership and production. That's what that position demands, and that's what I expect those guys to do. We'll go over here. Tom, Zach Ostrom of the Indianapolis Star. Following on with the quarterback question, I guess, as you went through the spring, new coordinators on offense, just getting a lot of that sort of built up and installed. What has changed about what you're looking for from the quarterback position as you do transition, to, transition into a different offense? Well, I think any time you make those changes, you know, there's the, the learning curve, you know. So basically, every, everybody kind of started on the same point, you know, as, as Connor Bazelak came in as in January. And Jack was already there. Dexter was already there and all the other quarterbacks in that room that were here. And so there, there's some common things that you're looking for, you know. And I think as you come off, you know, this past year, this is a great reminder of the, the value of protecting the football. 
You know, that's such a huge part of our game. You know, the, we all understand the value of the turnover ratio and how that's such a big part of winning football games. And, and uh, that's part protecting that quarterback touches it every single snap. So protecting that football to me is a huge priority. And, and to me, it's, it's about just having a great mastery of the offense and, and where to distribute the football uh, to the right players and per the, the scheme that we're having and per the call. So I want to find a guy that's able to do both of those at a high level. And then you got to win that locker room. That's that's really what it comes down to. That they know when you, even though nobody really huddles anymore, when you talk about that, the the uh, the idea of stepping in the huddle, and when no matter what much time was on the clock, if that guy's in that huddle, that we know we got a chance to go win the game with him as our leader. So to me, that's what I want our team to feel from that guy, and that's their individual responsibility to earn the position. We're going to do our best to get everybody in here, but we'll we'll start here. Just a reminder, please stand uh, before you. Uh, give your name and affiliation. Thank you. Zion Brown, Hoosier Huddle. Tom, you guys were voted last in the Big Ten East media preseason poll. Is that something you think you can use as motivation? Uh, there's no question. You know, I mean, you got to look at those things a certain way. I mean, last year it was the opposite, you know, and near the top and, and uh, it didn't work out that way, right? So uh, I think to me it's uh, you talk to our players today that are here. You talked about our team. Any, you pick anybody out of there and they're going to say one thing. It's about September 2nd. And that's our focus. That's all we're worried about. Uh, we, we talk about ear muscle and blinders in our program, and that's part of it. And I get it. We earned it. That's part of the uh, process you go through. And, and uh, I feel like that uh, um, our team understands that uh, we got a chip on our shoulder and something to prove. All right, Coach, to our left in the back. Tom Dustin, DePierac, Bloomington Herald Times. Uh, obviously, we found out yesterday uh, David Ellis and Dalen McCullough, the second, obviously, are not going to be playing this year for medical reasons. Uh, what kind of led to the decisions for those two guys, and is there anybody else for medical or any other reasons that is not going to be part of the program this year? Uh, not expecting any others at this time, uh, unless something happens to happen in the next several weeks. But uh, uh, just some, some long-standing challenges there for both those young men with injuries and, and to be able to get to that point. Uh, disappointed for both of them, met with both of them many times and, and you know, communicated with their families through that process. And so that's just a tough decision you have to come to, but it's a medical decision that, that we uh, as a coaching staff don't, uh, are, are not a part of in that regard. But it's always about the health and welfare of our guys and, and thinking about their long-term you know, health and being able to have uh, uh, you know, a body that's going to be able to have, not have long-term issues. So respect those guys, proud of them, appreciate them, going to be with them, and they'll stay with us here in, in a different capacity until they graduate. Okay, we'll have our final question down here in front. Coach, good morning. Haley good morning. Jordan, Sports Illustrated. You mentioned moving Donovan McCauley from quarterback position to wide receiver. How is he adjusting to that position, and who has been responsible for taking him under their wing? Well, he, I think he's responded well, and I, I will say that you know, he came to me, you know, and he wanted to, to do this, and, and uh, just uh, we had a great talk together about that, and he's a high competitive young man and one of the best athletes on our football team, and, and he wants to be on the field. He wants to be playing. He wants to be involved in special teams. He wants to be, you know, able to have those opportunities, and, and uh, he's got a big athletic frame, and, uh, but there's obviously a learning curve to be able to grow, and, and, and I think to me, you know, Coach Henry is taking him under his wing. You know, our new receivers coach and, and his NFL experience is, is tremendous. And uh, we coached against each other. I was at Ole Miss. He was at LSU in those three years when we battled against each other there. And, and uh, just a ton of respect for what he brings. And, and his whole coaching style and philosophy, just the way he handles our players, I, I think Dom has responded very, very well to him. And so I'm excited to see him be able to have this new opportunity and be able to help our football team be more explosive on offense and win football games. Thank you very much. Have an awesome day. Elio. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be back with everyone again. Uh, wow, here we go. College football 2022. Uh, 32 days from now, uh, we kick off the season, and uh, it's unbelievable how fast it's going to be upon us, uh, and uh, couldn't be more excited. Appreciate the kind words from Commissioner Warren. And, uh, you know, thank you to everyone here today and those around the country that cover Northwestern football in the Big Ten. Uh, we wouldn't uh, have our opportunities that we have today without you. So thank you so much for what you do uh, and, and how you cover our, our institutions and our programs. It's, uh, it's great to be back in Lucas Oil. Uh, being here two out of the last three seasons uh, has been something that uh, I think everyone has as a goal 
as we kick off all of our uh, 22 campaigns. Uh, you know, but to be here uh, a couple years ago is definitely a motivator uh, every time you step back uh, in, into this building as you get ready to embark on the season. I brought three absolutely outstanding young men and student athletes with me here uh, to represent our program. Offensively, offensive tackle Peter Skronsky uh, is, uh, you know, jumped out into the scene a few years ago and was an instant impact offensive lineman for us. Uh, on defense then, uh, out of Tamo Adebaware, who's, again, just like Peter, came into our program, quickly made a difference, took a big step last year, and, and look forward to watching him continue to progress. No doubt uh, has assumed the leadership of our football team and of our defense. And then Cam Mitchell, uh, another young man uh, like Peter from Chicago, uh, Land Community, Bolingbrook High School, and uh, you know, in the footsteps of Greg Newsom that's uh, playing for the Browns. Uh, is next, uh, you know, up to be potentially a, a high draft pick for us. Again, great leadership in the back end and has hit, had an outstanding career early in the kick game and then most recently uh, in the back end. But, uh, again, you guys didn't uh, come to hear me talk, so I'd love to answer any all questions you may have. And, like I said, excited to kick the season off. We report tomorrow and first practice is on Thursday. So uh, let's make this fast. So, no, go, no, honestly, go ahead. Go Cats. Thanks. All right, we'll open it up for questions for Coach. We'll start right over here. Hey, Coach, Tom Bruce, Sports Illustrated, Indiana. One of the toughest things about being in the Big Ten is uh, some high highs and some low lows that can follow quickly. What is uh, your message to your guys this year who have been through uh, that really good season two years ago and then the struggles from a year ago? Yeah, Tom, uh, you, you look at, you know, the whys. You know, you take the whole offseason to look at the cut-ups, uh, you know, really take a deep dive into schematically what we did, fundamentally what we did, how we, we can improve. Uh, you know, for us a year ago, you know, we were maybe one of the youngest from an experience standpoint in the Big Ten, where a lot of teams had most of their COVID guys come back. Two years ago, we had our most veteran team, 11 guys, get an opportunity to go on to the NFL. So, you know, that difference in experience, we're back to that experience level with, you know, about 65% of our production, you know, as you kind of take the quarterback position out of it. Uh, so a lot coming back, and we need to draw upon that experience. But, you know, fundamentally, we, we have to be better. We have to be better at just the, the basics of, of – you know, the execution of our offense, defense, kick game, and get back to playing at that championship level. Uh, again, we have enough veterans that have been a part of both type seasons, and we need to lean upon that, that experience to take that step back to, you know, first of all, getting back to, to bowl eligibility, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, you know, competing for championships again. And we, we expect to do that very quickly. Coach, to our left in the back. Geno Green, Post Game Central. Uh, USC, UCLA are joining the Big Ten in a couple of seasons. What are your thoughts on them being there and how it will impact you guys from a travel standpoint, even though there's still time left between now and 23? Yeah, Gino, I'm, I'm excited to add SC and UCLA. Um, you, you know, obviously the expansion of our footprint from the East Coast to the West, you're going to wake up watching Big Ten football and go to bed, you know, watching Big Ten football. So that's exciting for our, our players. It's, it's exciting for our fans. Uh, will there be a travel component to it? Yeah, there is, but you know we're we're going to Dublin in the opener. You know, I mean, so it won't be that big of a deal. But when you um, you, you, you know you look at the opportunities, especially for a school like Northwestern, we recruit you know worldwide. We have a huge alumni base in Southern California. A few years back, I spoke uh, at the Contemporary Art Museum to about 400 alums. Uh, we've always recruited California, so you know I'm excited to add that that component to it. Where it's going to go. Uh, and how things are going to shake out by the time we get to 24. I think we'll all uh, be excited to see how that goes. But uh, it, it'll definitely be a new new thing and, and a new opportunity. But I think the commissioner said it best. Uh, you know, change is, is kind of the, 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 the word uh, of college football right now. And, you know, we'll, we'll lean forward and embrace that. I saw somebody with their hand up here. Yep, over here. How you doing, Coach? Levon Whitaker, ABC 57 News in South Bend. Um, when you um, lose a guy of caliber like Brandon Joseph, um, who went over to Notre Dame, what does that do for your uh, backfield this year? Yeah, well, you know, transfers are part of, uh, you know, the college football landscape right now. We've brought some outstanding newcomers into our program, and uh, we've added competitive depth, I think, in positions we needed to up front in the defensive line. Uh, you know, for, for sure is an area that we felt like we needed to add a little bit more competitive depth, and I'm excited about that. Uh, but, you know, again, change is upon us, and, you know, 
maybe 17 years ago when I, you know, first stood up here uh, as a first year head coach. If you lost a player or two, it was, you know, something might be wrong with your program. Now it's just maybe a better opportunity for a young person at another institution. Uh, I've always been a firm believer in helping student athletes out and helping them do whatever's best for them and for their families and for their futures. And, uh, you know, if it's the guys that depart, you know, they know, and I've, I've had these conversations with them that I'll always be here for them. Uh, and the guys that we bring in as newcomers, you know, I couldn't be more ecstatic to have them be with us. But from a back end standpoint, to answer your question directly, it gives our, our secondary some guys that maybe that didn't have an opportunity, a new opportunity to, you know, showcase their skills and, and get out there and become starters. And so I feel like our, our secondary probably is one of our strengths on our team. And, uh, you know, looking forward to watching those guys, uh, you know, as they move forward this year. For here. Hey, Pat, Andy Wittry with On3. I think that every other Big Ten school has some sort of NIL entity or collective or nonprofit yeah. set up. I'm not sure I've seen one from Northwestern. So do you have any um, yeah. insight as to whether one will be announced? And if not, is that a concern at all? Yeah, Andy, private school. We don't have to tell you. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, there, there's obviously a lot of things that are in the works. Um, you know, I'm a little jealous of the guys right now. Uh, the mid-'90s NIL, you know, it would have been a good deal for me. So... Uh, but I'm doing fine and I have no complaints. So I'm all for whatever makes the experience of the guys better. You know, we've done a lot of things behind the scenes. You saw probably yesterday the announcement of the GM with Altius and things of that nature that we're progressing to, uh, that I'm really excited for our guys to be able to have that in-house uh, opportunity to really, for them to go to, to be able to leverage their brand and, and to leverage, you know, being in the Chicagoland market, which is outstanding. Uh, we're going to do things at Northwestern the Northwestern way. Uh, it's not about being first. It's about trying to strive to do what's best and doing it the right way. And uh, I have full confidence that uh, our guys will be, uh, you know, taken care of the right way uh, in the ways that we think fit our institution, our values. Um, and then the, the outside entities you really can't control. But, you know, I think uh, our alums and, and the folks that uh, touch our program understand the importance of this and want to make sure our guys are, are, are taken care of from a standpoint of professional growth, opportunities, financial opportunities, and look at this thing a little bit more holistically uh, than, than maybe just, um, you know, a few more dollars for a burger or something like that. Look at it a little bit more broad-based. Okay, we have time for a couple more for Coach Fitz. Over here. Hi, Pat. Scott Docterman with The Athletic. I wanted to ask you a little bit about Evan Hole at running back. He seemed to uh, really play well late in the year in particular. What kind of skills does he bring, and how can he help your team move forward this year? Yeah, Scott, you know, Evan's a complete back. Uh, you, know, you look at the over 1,000 yards rushing the ball. Uh, you know, we weren't maybe the balance that we wanted to have, and so people were able to load the box and be able to do that. A lot of that Evan was able to do after contact, and that shows you about his toughness and his physicality. He led the Big Ten as far as running backs and a receiving component, uh, so he's got great hands. Uh, I think he can be more involved also in the kick game, uh, and he's done a terrific job leading this summer. Just been so fun to watch Evan grow throughout his time in our, in, you know, in our program, and a lot of that credit goes to him. He's always been a first guy to show up, last guy to leave type mentality. To watch him kind of mature and wait, wait a second, maybe if I get another extra hour of sleep, or a little bit more recovery, I'll see some return on that investment. And, uh, you know, he's he's just a complete player. He's a complete person. And, you know, we're, we're really counting on him to get back to winning ways and back to championship football. And we have one last question. Come on, somebody's got to have one more question for Coach Fitz. Let's go into the break here on a positive note. Here we go. That's what happens when you win three games. Not a lot of questions. John Steppy with the Cedar Rapids Gazette. If the Big Ten does away with divisions and goes into a couple protected rivalries, are there a couple rivalries in particular that you would prefer get protected? Well, it's a great one, John. Um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And, you know, again, before I was a football coach, I was a football fan of the Big Ten. And, you know, I'll go back to when we actually had 10 teams. You know, we played everybody, and it was this, you know, like, really unique thing. Uh, that was pretty pretty awesome, I think, for us as student athletes and as fans. You know, I hope we're able to do that. I, I, I think it's less about the rivalries and more making sure that, 
you know, our players and our fans are able to step into every venue and able to experience the pageantry of Big Ten football and find a way to be able to put that into the schedule. It's going to be complicated. Uh, you, but when you look at it from a holistic standpoint, I hope that's the experience for our Big Ten student athletes. Being able to play a game in Piscataway, New Jersey, and going out and being able to play a regular season game in the Coliseum or the Rose Bowl and everything in between, you know, nobody else will be able to say that. And you're, you're talking about unique, iconic venues, cathedrals of college football that, that are in the Big Ten landscape. And, you know, the ability to participate in that as a student athlete, I think, is what's always made Big Ten football special. And I, I hope we're able to continue to keep that. The rivalries, that'll be fun. We'll cre create some cool trophies. And, you know, I'm sure one will be Illinois for us. And beyond that, we'll figure it out. But um, I think most, if not all, of our rivalries in the Big Ten have been built on respect. And I'm sure that that tradition will continue. Hello, good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. More like football in, in a stadium. Um, what can I tell you? It's been a, it's been a tremendous offseason for the Michigan Wolverine football program. Our guys from uh, literally days after our final game last year uh, have been at work attacking everything they do. Um, there's been zero entitlement the entire offseason and now and none really in the foreseeable future. So uh, life is good. Um, biological clock is ticking. And uh, we're ready to start and get the, uh, get the training camp underway. If there's any questions, be happy to take them. All right, we'll start back here. Please stand to introduce yourself and your outlet, please. Thank you. Uh, Coach Bill Bender, Sporting News. Um, in this day where quarterbacks come and go quickly in the transfer portal, how have you made it work with Cade and JJ last year, and um, how do you foresee that continuing as they go into this year? Well, last year uh, made it work. Both uh, both had phenomenal seasons. JJ in his his true freshman year, Cade in his junior year. Uh, both played outstanding, winning football every time they went out there. The really cool stat on Cade McNamara is over 50% of his drives end in points. And I don't know exactly what the number is for JJ, but seems like every time he got in there uh, and let it drive, it ended in points as well. Um, both really good. You know, they ask sometimes, you know, at other positions, who's going to play? I mean, the best player is going to play. We're going to know who the best player is by who plays the best. Cade McNamara is going to be really tough to beat out. Uh, for the starting quarterback job. J.J. McCarthy is going to be really tough to beat out for the starting quarterback job. Okay, we'll come down here, and then we've got one in the back over here. Hi, Coach Harbaugh. Uh, Tino Bovenzi with Spectrum News in Ohio. Uh, looking back at you know the success last year, you guys knocked off Ohio State for the first time in, in your tenure. And uh, you know, I wanted to ask, how was this off season for you? First off, do you feel like you had you know a little bit of relief to have this you know monkey off your back in a way? And uh, how you guys plan to carry that momentum into keeping this uh, you know that you know appearance in the Big Ten championship going and, and beating Ohio State consistently? Yeah, so it's been a um, it's been a really good continuation from last year's team. I think some of it, uh, you know, players that were on the team, you know, they put in that work, they uh, they know what it was like, and that uh, that good feeling of taking care of your business and and seeing it uh, have success and be rewarded for it. And they also saw other players on the team, um, guys like Aiden Hutchinson, Hassan Haskins. David Ajabo, who uh, who put in that work, got that work in, uh, and how much it paid off for them. Using uh, using your head, using your noodle, uh, pretty easy to think. Yeah, I want to do it just like they did it. I want to be where they 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 are now. And uh, it's been you know a continuation of that this entire off season. I mean, uh, just been been tremendous. Uh, Ethan Key with the Junior Journalism Program. Um, 
How are you planning to uh, carry the momentum from last year uh, to continue to get to the uh, championship? Yeah, we're just going to continue to attack. Um, and that's, that's what I re really love about this team. Uh, they really literally attack everything that's put in front of them. Okay, any more questions? I thought we had some, oh, okay. All right, let's go here and then we'll come up here and then we'll go here. Um, Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. Obviously, this is your second year in a row now with a new defensive coordinator, and you've got a new OC coming in as well. What is the you know transition process like with getting them up to speed with the team, and will there be any new concepts, new schemes installed, um, you know, based on the new personnel there? Yeah. So um, defensively, uh, it is a new defensive coordinator that wasn't on our staff last year, Jesse Minter. Um, I'd have to go back to. Um, before the 2021 season, when I was looking for a defensive coordinator, my brother John recommended two coaches to me. He said, you can have Mike McDonald or Jesse Minner. Really take your pick. They're both great. One's in the secondary, one's uh, a linebacker coach. And I talked to Mike McDonald first, really, really liked him, uh, and, and talked to Jesse some, but I was went down the road of Mike McDonald. He did a fantastic job. Now he's returning to the Baltimore Ravens as their defensive coordinator. So I went back and talked to Jesse Minter right when, uh, when, when Mike left and just felt like it was, it was the absolute best thing for our team. Both Jesse and Mike McDonald, along with my brother and, and Wink, had really devised that Ravens defensive system. They were in on the ground floor. And uh, an added bonus that, that uh, Jesse Minter uh, got a year of defensive play calling under his belt as the defensive coordinator at Vanderbilt. So outstanding. On offense, both uh, our co-coordinators were on the staff last year. Both Sharon Moore and both Matt Weiss were on the staff. Um, Matt Weiss is incredibly smart. He is one of those persons that when, you, when you're doing a project uh, so detailed, thinks about it from every angle, plans everything out. Um, I'm, I've never met a play I don't like and always feel that our players can execute anything. Just give them the chance and, you know, I, just, let's just get started and, 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 and get the project going. Damn the torpedoes. I've never screwed up anything so bad that I couldn't uh, change it or throw it away. Uh, so we make the perfect, perfect blend, really, uh, between Matt and myself. And, and then Sharon is really kind of, he is the living embodiment of both Matt Weiss and myself. He's right there. Uh, uh, and the most important, because he's coaching the offensive line. Uh, and... So it's an incredible group that way. Also, Mike Hart um, does a great job in the run game, in the, in the blitz protections. Uh, Ron Bellamy is another person like uh, Matt Weiss, very detailed, very organized, uh, you know, very analytical about uh, plays and projects. And uh, Grant Newsom, who is also on the staff as a, as a graduate assistant, our tight ends coach, uh, who's who's tremendous, will be, uh, will be a great coach, uh, and already is. So it's a, it's a tremendous group. Uh, we have some really great analysts as well. So I feel great about the, the offensive staff. I feel great about the defensive staff. OK, we'll go to our right coach in the back. Hi. Um, good morning, coach. My name is Emily Williams. I'm part of the Junior Journal Journalism Program. Um, you won the Big Ten Championship and made it to the playoffs. Both are huge accomplishments. What do you hope to achieve this season? Right, so um, our goals would be to beat Ohio State and Michigan State in the same year, win the Big Ten Championship, and win the National Championship. Those are our four goals.
I know we had a question up over here. Oh, right up here. And this will be our last one. Yeah, Tom Crawford, Press Pass, Fox 47, Lansing. Jim, uh, schedule-wise, non-conference, group of five are the only opponents this year, I believe, next year as well. And then Oklahoma and Texas come on board. Is there going to be more of a, a surge to getting more uh, Power Five conference teams in the future for schedule for home games as opposed to the group of five? I don't know. What goes into decision making on that? Have we played Power Five in the non conference? We played Notre Dame, Washington. We played Group of Five in the non conference. I don't, I'm answering your question. I don't know if there'll be more of a, how did you put it? Power Five. You know, with more the, Power Five yeah, teams? Yeah, yeah, where you get, where you get an, a Texas and Oklahoma coming to Ann Arbor. I think I'm, I'm getting feedback from Michigan fans that they wish. There was more of those teams coming to Ann Arbor as opposed to the Colorado States, Hawaii's, and the Yukons. So that's my comment. Or you can share that feedback some point with Ward Manual and you guys can discuss it. <laughs>